Okay, how about we get started, everyone? <clears throat> My name is Joanne Harris Duff. I am the program manager for diversity, equity, and inclusion at VCU Health System. And I am very happy to be here to celebrate Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage History Month. So we have a great program today, but how about I tell you a little bit about AAPI Month? <clears throat> So since 1990, the US government has designed the month of May as Asian American Pacific Islander Month, celebrating the achievements and contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States. The month of May was chosen to commemorate the immigration of Japanese Americans to the United States in May on May 7th, 1843 and to mark the anniversary of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad on May 10, 1869. The majority of the workers who laid the tracks were Chinese immigrants. <clears throat> this year's theme in 2022 was selected by the Federal Asian Pacific American Council. It is Advancing Leaders Through Collaboration which builds on a leadership advancement theme series that began just last year. So we're, I'm excited to also share that the co-director of Chinese um, for Affirmative Action and co-founder of Stop AAPI Asian Hate is Cynthia Choi. She is the one that says this month is a time to speak out, share stories and debunk myths about Asian communities. She said, it's not only time to celebrate Asian culture and diversity, but it's, in, it's time for us to unite as an entire community in the United States of America. So I'm really excited that we have an opportunity to do that today. And we have a great, great program. So what I'd like to do is introduce someone very, very special. <clears throat> Um, her name is Lindai Xia, and Lindai is a doctoral student in the Counselor Education Supervision Program at Virginia Commonwealth University. Lindai is an internal, international student from China. She works as a graduate assistant at the International Education um, Studies Center. She has experience in both international student counseling and student affairs, and a large number of international students she works with are Asian. International students' lived experiences, life satisfaction, and adjustment issues are her current research interests. As an Asian international student majoring in counseling, Linda I would like to advocate for this group and support other international students by applying what she has learned and combined with the experience she has as an insider. And so we're excited that today she's gonna be sharing a poem with us. And the poem that she is reading today is, I am from poem. And she is self-authored. I've encouraged Linda to um, work on publishing this because you will definitely enjoy it. It is beautifully written. So welcome Linda, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Joanne. So let me share my screen. Oops, sorry. Okay, so the poem I'd like to share with you all is an I am from poem, which is written by me in my first semester at VCU, which is three years ago. Um, so let me read it. Uh, I am from Poim. Uh, I am from Guiyang, a beautiful city in the south part of China. There are 56 ethnic groups in my country, and you can find 35 of them in this city. The climate is pleasant and the environment is comfortable. It's a famous forest city surrounded by mountains. It has the third largest waterfall in the world and the 11 forest parks. Orchids and the bamboo can be seen everywhere. Cigarettes and tea made here are sold all over the world. Food is what I miss all the time. Um, people in Guiyang like spicy food. 
the chili sauce made there is also popular in the U United States. It is no exaggeration to say the founder of one famous chili sauce brand, Miss Tao, is better known than idols. So for me, she is just as famous as Tyler Swift. Um, at 11 p.m., when most people are getting ready for bed, the nightlife of people in Guiyang has just begun. Barbecue, hot pot, and other delicious food I don't know how to translate can be found in the night market. I am from this far away land, which is 30,246 kilometers away from VCU. However, I would love to go back even if I run out of energy, even if it cost me more than 27 hours by plan. For me, it is a memorable place and the reason to work hard. One day I will be back there to play mahjong with my friends during the day and go to the night market for snacks at night. I apologize, this is the best retirement I, I could have imagined three years ago, but I believe you can feel my homesickness and how proud I am of my city. Um, it also shows the importance of home or actually the concept of family for us. In, cause in our culture, we do value family or filial piety and uh, such concepts that originated from Confucian. So it is true that family responsibility sometimes brings us stress, but most of the time it brings us energy, motivation, and power. So when talking about family, there are two interesting terms I would like to introduce. So for the wife, of one couple, family member can be categorized into two types. One is ren. So the translation is members from my family. So we have genetic connections. And the other one is ren, um, which represents members of the husband's family. So in the US, we call them blah, blah, blah in laws. Um, those are two specific terms the wife usually uses, but not for the husband. Um, we consider Ren as a group of people who really care about me and only care about me, protect me, and are always there when I need them, especially when I argue with my husband. So Joanne said when I introduced Dr. Xu, I should not only talk about her bio, but also why she is special. So for me, Dr. Xu is the Ren, not only the one of my family members, but also the one who understand me and helps me, always helps me. As international student, like what I wrote in the poem, we are far away from our home country. So I appreciate that we have Dr. Xu, a productive professor, an organized director, a supportive supervisor, and a role model. So then let's welcome my teacher, my friend, and my Nyangjiaren, Dr. Yao Yinshi. Thank you so much, Lin Dai, for the beautiful introduction. I, I got uh, choked, I got emotional now. Thank you. I love your poem too. And I particularly like it. I'm, I'm so much honored to be your Nyangjiaren. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. So, for this conversation. And I also want to thank Joanne and um, Adam and uh, everybody else on the panel for the opportunity. From start, can you all see the screen? Let yes. me know um, if there's yes. a problem. Okay. Perfect. <clears throat> that was a beautiful introduction, Linda. Thank you again. I'm so much honored to have this opportunity to have a dialogue. It's not, you know, as professors, we all tend to lecture, process. Um, but uh, the purpose of today is I, I really wanted to start a dialogue and to continue this dialogue. Um, first of all, let me uh, say my name. My name is Yao Ying Xu, as you can see from the screen. But I also have a longer name. And then you will see why I have the longer name. 
So if I see my whole long name is Yao Ying Grace Shu Biggers. So it depends on in what context that um, you will have, I have a different uh, variations of my name. Could it be Yao Ying Biggers, Grace Biggers, Yao Ying Shu, which is my official legal name since I um, arrived in the United States. Uh, and then you could also tell that why I have uh, another uh, or add uh, my last name, Biggers, depending on what context. So sometimes uh, when I'm in a community when nobody could feel comfortable or say out loud Yao Ying Shu, they can selectively choose the words Grace Biggers. That would be me too. Although sometimes people say, you don't look like Grace Biggers. So academically, officially, legally, I am still Yao Ying Shu. I'm a professor in counseling and the special education department at the School of Education um, at the VCU. I'm also the director of the International Educational Studies Center at the School of Education. And you, I will talk a little bit later on um, how I studied this center. And the title of my talk today is My Journey to the West. And uh, before I really started to talk on uh, my personal experience and my perceptions, um, I would like to show on screen this map, which I took about uh, three years ago before the pandemic, 2019, October, when I traveled back to Shanghai. And that was before the plane arrived in uh, Shanghai airport. And I took this uh, picture from the airplane. And I thought, well, that I just started a new era about my journey as a scholar to increase and to promote the culture between the US and China. And then guess what? Uh, three years later, I am still here, got stuck trying to find a ticket that I could go back to China to visit because of the pandemic. So that we cannot avoid the context of pandemic. Its impact is on everybody. So I cannot avoid that uh, pretend it's not happening. I, even I could find a ticket, I cannot afford a ticket. It's somewhere between one way ticket, it's around $15,000, 15,000 US dollars. So I have my family in China. Uh, so I feel stuck. It's so one word now how I feel is I am stuck right here, sitting in my office but I still feel hopeful because I believe the pandemic will be over. Sometime will be over. This is the little background that I would like to share with you how I feel now, but I'm also happy to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about my lived experience to start when I started as an international student in the US and later become a faculty member, and then now I am a Chinese American because I became a US citizenship in 2019. And one of the driving motive that make me make me make that major decision was I wanted to vote. I wanted to practice a citizen 100%. And the price of that is I had to give up my Chinese citizen. And because of that, I had to get a visa to visit China. And all that, it was, it's not easy at all. The pandemic adds so much to everything. But I'm here, I also talk something beyond my own personal experience. I also want to share that how my view and the perspectives regarding the impact of culture on education, 
particularly educational values and the practices. But I also want to make sure clearly that uh, this is just my own perspective. I'm not representing any group or any community, but this is my perspective as a Chinese American who has lived in the US for over 20, about 25 years. And I also wanted to see that to me, education is a process outcome and identity. And I cannot really separate one from the other. So let's see, um, start with uh, this. Everybody probably if you who has taken psychology 101, let's see, probably we will be reminded what I'm talking about. Your first impression, is this a beautiful young lady or a miserable, miserable old lady? And particularly your first impression. I'm not going to ask you to tell me your first impression is, but I want to get everybody's attention is how our first impression could be formed or affected by our own experience. And then I also want us our attention about how I view and how many of us we have shared that how do we value education. Education is more than just what we see or the things. Education also involves how we perceive and how we perceive involves the environment. So this first, again, your first impression when you look at this figure is that the balance, the base you first see or two angry profiles facing each other. Again, the three key words that I put a guest out here, organized perceptions of the relationships among things rather than things themselves. So the three key words in this uh, statement, perception, relationship, and uh, things. The reason that I want to bring it up is lots of times, lots of times that we make decisions based on our perceptions and that perception is based on relationships instead of the fact, the reality. So if I would view education, this is the figure actually, of course, I searched uh, in the internet. I thought, oh, this would represent how I view education. I always believe education is the foundation of everything. But of course, education is not just a formal education I'm talking about. It's any kind of education, formal, informal. But this foundation is a more than one root. And I believe that though all these multiple roots are intertwined and integrated and interrupted, interacted each other or one another, because look at our own background. Every one of us with no exception we have our own story. Don't tell me you don't have your story. Every single one of us has our story to tell. And uh, many of us have multiple stories. And uh, throughout a lifetime, you know, we also make those stories richer, more meaningful, and that help form who we are today as an individual and as a part of the community. So then back to the uh, purpose of education, I intentionally choose these two individuals because if from surface, these two individuals would be very different in terms of their background, cultural, as well as uh, political beliefs. But if we just pick some of what they were saying or they are practicing, we will find something, some common 
common values that shared between these two individuals. The top is uh, was uh, written by Lyndon Johnson. We all knew he was the 35th president of the United States. And he was saying, for the individual, education is the path to achievement and the fulfillment. For the nation, it is a path to a society that is not only free, but civilized. And for the world, it is the path to peace. For it is education that places reason over force. And then another individual, the, the second bullet, Dr. Tao Xingzhi. Tao Xingzhi was a famous educator in China. And I had a, I picked three bullets about his philosophy. The first was about which means education is living experience or life is education. School is the social context. In other words, the society is our school context. Teaching, learning, and doing is one thing instead of three different things. This probably sounds familiar to many of you. And I'm, I'm, I feel very confident those philosophies, you don't feel strange or new. Because indeed, Dr. Tao Xingzhi was one of the proud students of Zhang Dui in the early uh, 19th century. And we all know the educational philosophy of John Dewey was uh, learning through experiential education, learning through doing. So from these two different perspectives, we can find some values. And most people would think like they are like almost black and white and uh, east and west, but indeed, what I want to see how do we view people who are very different from us? I always feel very privileged that I have a little bit of both, not completely understand both, but I have direct experience like many of us, a uh, little bit both cultures. Let's see, from the West perspective, the East could be viewed family oriented, obedient, obedient, or following all directions, hardworking, collectivity. On the other hand, from the East perspective, the West could be viewed as independent, self determined, problem solving, individualism. And that sounds pretty good, right? Pretty positive. But again, depending on individual's perspective, this could be also perceived very negatively. Like a family oriented could be perceived as a dependent. Independent could be perceived as a selfish. Collectivity could be perceived as dictatorship. Individualism could be perceived lack of social responsibility. So depending on how we perceive and that, that perceive is also related to how we experience, what is our experience. And then we want as a society, we wanted to be positive whenever possible, but it's not always possible or it's not always there and so obvious. What I would like to share a little bit of personal experience is what does East and the West mean to me as an individual as well as a professional? I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this literature because uh, that will take another day or month to explain. Um, this literature, Linda would understand uh, very well. This um, 
uh, journey, C U G, journey to the direct translation would be journey to the West. The journey to the West, I you try to think about uh, equivalence in the uh, West culture, I think the impact, the story are very different, the story is very different, but the impact I could uh, think of uh, equivalence would be uh, the wonderful Wizard of Oz. It's uh, very popular in China and uh, for generations, hundreds of years. So a little longer, uh, long, it lasted longer as the classic classical literature than the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Uh, but it's uh, as popular. So just give you a little context. Anyway, I cannot think of better uh, analogy of my experience, my own experience to this story, Journey to the West. I encourage you all, even you just Google it, Journey to the West, a classical Chinese literature, you will find some stories. But all I want to tell you here is, I always compare myself to this monkey, monkey Sun, Sun Wukong. And because his adventure, his loyalty, and uh, his spontaneity, and his struggles, and I could relate many of his uh, character, but um, I encourage you to explore and find out there are more than 20 languages that have been available about this literature. So I wanna just share, I try to find the two closest picture that would represent me and um, 30 years, 30 years ago to me nowadays, what did they take? When I started teaching at a medical school in China as a, a very naive instructor or assistant professor and later a lecturer, and then I came to the US in 1995. Um, other than, of course, getting older, uh, I always wonder what did it take for me from this young girl to uh, experienced individual. My first impression always, oh my gosh, yeah, I could not believe I could not believe I survived those years. That was always my first impression. Remember I shared the impression earlier, but then there would be a lot of more come out from that first impression. And fortunately, most of those, they are positive, like hard work, persistence, and also independence which I often amazed myself how independent I became before I even realized that because I was very dependent before I came to the US. I was one of those three siblings. I have two brothers and was the only daughter. I always thought, okay, my family would take care of me, would get married and somebody would take care of me. But I was amazed how independent I have become in a positive way. And guess what? One positive theme came from this reflection was support. I have received numerous supports, variety of supports at all levels, individually, and as, as, as well as, as a community from my professors, friends, peers, and the students, and the, of course, my family. So what did it take? It takes a whole globe. I would not see the village, of course, we see the global village for me to grow from an individual with a very, very limited experience to a more experienced professional with more knowledge and skills, with less judgmental, who valued education and be proud of what I do. And that's uh, uh, just a start. I feel that still just start because it continues. 
continuous challenge between the two cultures. I always consider myself that I'm ethnically, I am Chinese. It doesn't matter, you are a US citizen, you are ethnically, that's my identity, Chinese American. I'm always Chinese ethnicity. I'm a US citizen because I function as a citizen and I want to serve this society. It's easier to say that, hey, I'm a, a Chinese American, I'm functioning as a member of this community. It, there are so many challenges. It sometimes could be it happening every day. And particularly, particularly what make it worse in the last two years, last two and a half years. And I had directly experienced harassment for no reason. And it happened on our campus, right next to my building. And that which I considered is my own community. And the people would walk toward me and show me a middle finger. And I didn't even know that person. That hurts, that hurts so much because this is my home, US culture. U.S. is the culture I adopted. Chinese culture is the culture I inherited. It's these two cultures that form who I am. But it happened several times. In around um, summer 2020, particularly um, in the last couple of years. But when we talk about continuous balance, uh, challenging. I, I also consider myself being fortunate because I know that we all have to struggle. And I also realize that I am empowered because of my experience. And I'm aware of the support that I have. But think about the people who are under-resourced who are not aware of support and uh, who are treated unfairly. They did not have nowhere to go. And those are the people that they are desperate who need support and they may not get them. Think about that. Um, I, I appreciate it that we have this month, but one month is not enough. It's every day is a part of our life. but stay positive. I'm a scholar and I'm an educator. I, my, by definition, I consider myself a educational researcher because I do applied research. So when I look at the cross-cultural competency, I view this is a dynamic process. And from scholarly perspective, I also have data to show that as an individual and as a group that, that overlap between China and the US, the, that the cross-cultural overlap actually for me as an example, and based on my research, this is dynamically changing. It's not static because this shared area between China and US is becoming larger and bigger. However, it will never completely 100% overlap because we always have our own identity, which has not, it's nothing wrong, which actually is the beauty of this country, the multicultural America. When we share the common values, we keep our individual value and identity. That's how we make this country so beautiful and stronger and unified. It does not mean we have to share everything about our culture, our individual identity and our collective identity. So for me, I have witnessed the, this dynamic process and then it's the overlapped areas becoming bigger and more reflective. However, I'm always Chinese American. 
And again, this is such a um, privileged journey that not every individual may not have this op opportunity. So back to as a researcher, I always um, remind myself, what can I do to benefit our community, our larger society? And uh, I have uh, developed a curriculum for our teacher education program. And I have studied some research and publications related to intercultural communicative competencies. And this uh, process is what I developed. And I realized that may be beneficial to many of us. It doesn't matter that where you're from because each one of us bringing our own cultural heritage. We studied a linguistic competency, for example. And let's be aware that when many of us as international students or international scholars like myself, Chinese American, we are aware that the target language in this country is English. You may not like it, but that's the fact. You have to make sure that we grasp, master the target language as well as needed. And you know we, you can conquer it. It may not be the same dialect, dialect or accent you are speaking, but I know I master this target language because I wanted to empower myself. So that's the linguistic competence, have the language because we have to function using the target language to communicate at all levels, oral communication. And that will help us, that will equip us with knowledge, foundational knowledge. This linguistic competence will lead to broader communicative competence. And in a broader context, it involves the cultural and the skills. Again, this culture and the languages are related, but they are not the same thing. Culture is a bigger context. And then the outcome would be intercultural communicative competence that may include cultural specific knowledge as well as cultural general skills. So this process is something I, I put here, but I encourage every one of us continue exploring what does that take to be more culturally responsive? What kind of competencies that require us to be interacting with people from different background? And what's our personal journey will affect our professional judgment because sometimes we cannot really afford to make a misjudgment, particularly in my research area, is early intervention for children with disabilities or developmental delays. And they are the most vulnerable population. We cannot afford making mistakes. So better prepare ourselves. So to um, summarize, I truly believe all three components of the cultural or any culture and would have a huge impact on education, perspectives, practices, and the products. In terms of perspectives, is how we view, is the psychological nature of culture. It's how we view, how we, how, how, what our ideas and then our attitudes toward some behavior. And then of course the practices is the social aspect of culture and that involves actions, interactions and both perspectives and practices lead to the products or the outcomes. So how we view, how we act leads to what we produce. And what we produce really matters 
when we apply that in a meaningful context and that will make us more culturally relevant, culturally responsive. As a Chinese American, I always reflect that how much influence I have been uh, as, at the individual level from my traditional Chinese background. But at the same time, I also appreciate how much influence that I have received from the adopted culture, the West culture. And I'm proud of being such an individual. And again, that's not enough. And we will see that what can we do to make our society better? I'm going to stop there because I want to have some time for people to have questions. Um, I just want to share this uh, uh, logo here. Education is beyond the borders, which is the logo of uh, the Center of uh, International Educational Studies Center at the School of Education. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I frequently uh, check emails. I think I'm going to stop sharing the screen so then uh, we have opportunities to have a dialogue or have for questions. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Xu. I want, I wish that we were in person so I could stand up and give you um, applause. I think that you would have so, so, so many. Um, so today when I was listening to you, I thought about your words, adventure, loyalty, communication, and then you said struggle. And so I felt compelled to make sure that I shared that I think that your achievement is incredibly powerful. So adding that achievement there, just powerful. Um, so my mom used to share that when you hear a voice of someone special, you can feel it like all the way to your soul. Um, and she says, that's how you know that you've met someone who is changing the world. So hearing you today, Dr. Xu, um, I hear my mom's voice because I feel my soul um, that you were changing the world. Um, and I, yes, you are amazing professional academic success is just unparalleled. And you sharing with us today, the purpose of your education is, is absolutely moving. But I also want to share that you spoke of the support you've received. Um, and as I said, the support you've offered others. And you talked about a global village. Um, I think here in your life journey, um, as you've experienced it is incredibly inspiring. And I know that you've inspired others here today. Um, I, you know, I hope that other folks, and I can definitely speak for myself, feel the beauty that you offer to our community, students, your colleagues, our local community members. Um, and so, you know, you sharing your true leadership and, um, and is at the center of so many students' lives, like Linda, I talked about. Um, and you're right, one month is definitely not enough. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your story today. Um, I feel incredibly blessed that you uh, joined us today as keynote. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Joanne, for the Absolutely. opportunity. Thank you for inviting me. I, I feel very grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got some questions here for you. Um, so the first one is, um, it kind of supports at the end of um, your PowerPoint, your presentation about your field. Um, so what made you decide to teach counseling and special education as well as lead the International Educational Studies Center? That's a great question. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, very briefly, uh, I, because, you know, when in, regarding life story, I could spend uh, two hours or 10 hours. So I'm trying to be <laughs> mindful of time, but very briefly um, to answer the question directly in short version is how that's how I was prepared as uh, at a graduate school. I received my master's of education in special education 
from University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and a doctoral degree in special education early childhood from the same university. And that's a shorter version of why uh, I'm teaching at the Department of Counseling and Special Education. A little longer version was uh, when I came, I did not mention that earlier in the PowerPoint, that's part of the struggle um, without getting too emotional. When I came to the United States, my son was two years old. And I was um, a cultural representative in Disney World. Uh, supposed to stay one year. And that experience was not beautiful at all. It was uh, pretty ugly. Um, and I would not go any further. And um, there was nothing as I uh, expected. So I decided to choose uh, to think, reflect like, okay, I had one year in the US with uh, the a government visa. And I'm a mother of two. I could not just go back to China without learning anything. This was the dreamland for myself. I decided to choose early childhood education just because the time I missed from being my, with my son. And then when I got my, and I tried to get my master's in one year and well, I did because my goal is to get a master's at least uh, something I can learn from this country and go back home with my son. And of course, life changes when I got my master's uh, at the end of the year, my advisor, who was one of my primary supporters came to me, why are you not applying for the doctoral program? Uh, because you can uh, help more children. So I called my father, I said, my advisor wanted me to get a PhD, but I wanted to be home. My father's one respond was, the Xu family needs a PhD, go for it. We'll take care of your child at home. I said, oh, but I miss my child, I'm a mother. So see the family priority over individual priority. I did not, I, I was miserable as a mother, but I was doing something, my family was proud. So that's professionally, I was prepared to uh, teach research, early intervention, special education assessment, and then the second part of your question, Joanne, is why I studied uh, the center, the International Educational Studies Center. And that was uh, in 2018. Um, I was uh, promoted to full professor in 2016. At that point, I started to, uh, to reflect on my professional journey, like, all right, Academically, you reach the top. <laughs> What's the next? And I uh, raised my son, who is doing pretty well in the medical school, third year now. But what's my? What can I do more? So that I thought, okay, I wanted to serve others more. Like Linda was one of our first uh, students we recruited. We wanted to support our students, particularly students who are from other countries um, who need the support. And uh, in general, I had a very positive experience. I want them to experience similar positive experience. So I started a center three years ago. However, two and a half of that was pandemic. So we will not be able to travel much. Um, we try our best to support our students here on campus. So Dr. Xu, that's amazing. And I also just want to note that I, this is the first time I'm learning that you started the center. So I know you lead that center, you're the driving force of that center, but it was not shared with me that you are the founder of that center. I want everyone to know that. That's something that folks should know. Um, and I, again, it reminds me of what Linda is talking about. Um, that you are truly at the center of so many people's families. Um, so share with me this. Um, so I have a question, another question here that is um, in addition to that question. So what is your driving force to continue your work in academia, specifically in this field and with the center? Yeah. Um, the first thing I could come quickly is, um, academic freedom. 
I, I still believe myself is a idealist. Um, but being an idealist, you know, there's that discrepancy between what is ideal and what is reality. But um, I still think I am a very good fit in academia because I like ideas. And then I cannot think of any other profession would pay me to apply my idea into practice. So I'm grateful that I have a decent salary that allow me to apply my idea into action. I just, that was just uh, the shorter version of that is I'm an idealist, but the, I also like to take action a constructivist. And then we are paid to do our work. And this work is I'm passionate about. Lots of times people are not as fortunate, like they have to make a living and then go home and practice their hobby. But I think my hobby and my passion is uh, my work. <laughs> Yes, I love that. I love that. I love that about academia also. Um, we have a, just a little bit of time left, but I, I have a big question, Dr. Shu, is the last one, and it's tough. Um, so although we have, and you spoke um, to this when you were sharing with us some discrimination that um, you experienced, um, although we have several hate crime um, bills, uh, in this country, we continue to find ourselves um, in a fragmented and segregated cultural environment. Um, I think about last week at the spa shooting of two Asian women who were murdered. And I think about this, I think about this weekend in Buffalo, the killing of 10 black people, um, both racially motivated hate crimes. And so, what do you as a leader see the most critical changes that we must make to face a brighter and, and more unified, you know, future culture as a people here in this country? Yeah, that is a big and a tough question, Joanne. Thank you for asking that question. It is, uh, it, it's, we all know there's no easy answer but uh, just uh, from my perspective, number one thing that I could think of is uh, we needed to reach out to individuals and the communities. We cannot just uh, wait until things happen and then react. We needed to be proactive. We needed to reach out people before tragedy happens. And I know no system is perfect and then we still have lots of, um, we, we have things um, happening around our uh, building, um, you know, needed to improve. Every individual has that social responsibility. That's how I strongly believe it's not somebody else's job. It's not just a police job or it's not just a person's job. It's everybody's social responsibility and then to reach out to each other so we can really unite together. And of course, that may not be the solution, but the first step, I believe it starts from every one of us, regardless of how different we are. If we truly believe the shared value it's I, I you know, we cross all the cultures. We share the value of what um, kindness, honesty, hard work. I do not see any other culture would not value this, but our society now is at a risk because a uh, quite percentage of people think that that's not a part of my job. That's not a part of, I'm not responsible. You do your job. No, I believe it's everyone's responsibility to share that responsibility, to protect our children and to really act that we together, we need to unite. It's not just like you're a Chinese citizen or American citizen. No, we, this is our shared environment. 
period. So um, I've been struggling about some reactiveness or some passiveness or people believe that all things will better, but uh, it takes one person or every person to actually say, hey, we cannot wait. Look what's happening around us. The pandemic is only triggering it. The real problem is a people pandemic or other disasters or other uh, natural problems, they will happen because that's part of nature. But if we are not aware that this sense of urgency, then I think we, we all have a big problem. So I think back to your question, we should uh, reach out to each other and uh, really unite to each other and start with uh, from us, start from each individual. Um, Fundamentally, I believe education. And uh, we do need to be aware that lots of curriculum does not cover what it's supposed to cover. We need to uh, prepare our children for their future. So I do believe through the education as a foundation, but we need to take actions. I agree. Oh my goodness. Kindness, honesty, hard work, us coming together. It doesn't take just one of us. That is powerful. And your words just, again, just are truly touch, you know, my soul. Thank you so much for that. Um, and again, uh, Dr. Shu, I just appreciate you being here today. Um, your words um, also help me, um, you know, I want to remind everyone here that um, what, what Dr. Shu is talking about is one of the reasons why we have um, dire conversations every, the last Wednesday um, of every month from 12 to 1. And what Dr. Shu talked about, you know, being, showing kindness and honesty and hard work and us coming together as a community to, to fight against hate. Um, that's what we're gonna be talking about. What Dr. Shu is talking about, we're gonna be talking about that dire conversations next week. Um, you can find the link for that conversation, for that program. As I said, it's next Wednesday. Um, and so I hope that you join us next Wednesday, May 25th from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Again, it's on the DEI um, intranet, intranet um, page. And if you need a link, send me an email and I'll be happy to share that with you. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Shu. And just thank you for being here. Lindai, your poem is amazing. Your words are powerful. And I just, I'm so, I feel so happy that you're part of VCU. Um, so thank you both. Thank you everyone for attending. And I hope everyone has <clears throat> a really good day. And remember Dr. Shu's words, kindness, honesty, and hard work. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.